Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Barack Obama goes to Norway. They gasped in shock. And the global media go to town on the Nobel Peace Prize story. <laughs> Gossip reporters in England gagged again. This time, it's the Tiger Woods scandal. Eritrea. <laughs> Off the radar for the global media. What is the story there? and the five-year-old Japanese boy strumming his way to fame on YouTube. Back in October, when U.S. President Barack Obama was announced as the surprise winner of the 2009 Nobel Peace Prize, the global media went into overdrive. Outlets across the political spectrum were united for a change, but mostly in their bemusement at how a new leader of a country in the middle of two wars could win such a prestigious award for peace. We're going to look now at round two of the coverage that took place when Obama flew to Norway to accept the accolade and deliver a speech, a message about how a just war could be fought in order to preserve peace. There was a definite shift in the tone of the coverage, with the right-wing media in the U.S. mostly placated by Obama's decision to escalate the war in Afghanistan, and the left-wing media unsure, it seemed, of how to react. Our starting point this week is Oslo, the Nobel ceremony, and the coverage of a speech that even for a politician renowned for his eloquence was a tall order. on President Obama and the Nobel Peace Prize. The mainstream news media reported the news from Oslo the conventional way. The award that carries a citation, a gold medal, and $1.4 million. A genuine honor with no real parallel in the world. The alternative media, like the U.S. cable channel Current TV, offered a different satirical approach. The 2009 Nobel Peace Prize goes to Barack Obama. And satire is most effective when it contains elements of truth. The irony of the speech is that Obama is receiving the award just, just a week after he announced a very large escalation in the war in Afghanistan. I'm sorry, a quick question. Did I see something in the news the other day about you sending another 30,000 troops to Afghanistan? Yes. For fighting and killing and, and bombing? Thing. How could he accept such an award while being engaged in two wars? Media outlets here try to justify the prize saying that it was given to him for having good intentions for peace. Heck, can I stay at home if I only have the good intentions to show up for work? The 2009 Nobel Peace Prize goes to Barack. It's just that this is a Nobel Peace Prize. I am humbled by this great honor. You know that war kind of goes against our whole deal here, right? For his extraordinary efforts. To... Two months ago, when the Nobel Committee announced President Obama had won the Peace Prize, it lauded his diplomatic efforts, his promotion of nuclear non-proliferation, and his reaching out to the Muslim world. Obama's subsequent escalation of the war in Afghanistan put the committee in an awkward position. However, it seems to have helped the president with his critics on the political right of the U.S. media. This is a worthy war, and it's something the world should support. I think that's an important message at this time as we're trying to get allies to join us in Afghanistan. Okay. It's important for foreign audiences to know, uh, they might not be aware of this, but uh, what uh, happens in the United States is driven completely by the right-wing media reaction to it. So when Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize, the right wing was outraged in this country. So the press went ballistic, and they covered it. Reporters <laughs> were covering this. They, they gasped in shock. Should he have gotten it? Should he have not gotten it? It'd be like giving someone an Oscar in the hope that it would encourage them to make a decent motion picture. Now, when he gave the speech, we had a completely different reaction. I have no problem with Obama getting the Nobel Peace Prize. I think it's good for America. Anything that ties the USA into peace is good. Turns out a lot of the people that are right-wing in this country like this speech, because to some degree, he defended war. There will be times when nations acting individually or in concert, will find the use of force not only necessary, but morally justified. By the time he got around to receiving the award and delivering his lecture, he had had time to really construct a complex and well-reasoned discussion of war and peace, essentially. And by then, the consensus had, had converged around the fact that he did a good job of, of uh, explaining all the complexities around war and peace. Uh, I didn't start the war. Oh, I know. 
I know! But I intend to finish it. There are still those who wish to destroy the progress we've made in Afghanistan. Now, as we speak, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are planning their war against democracy and freedom. It would be irresponsible for us to stand by and do nothing. See, that feels very bushy to me. You know, like Bush. Brother, I didn't tell you to give me this award. Okay. So, the 2009 Nobel Peace... You're making us look bad, is what I'm saying. By awarding the Peace Prize to a war president, the Nobel Committee brought this public relations problem on itself. The organization knows how the media work. In giving the award to Obama, the Nobel Committee perhaps intentionally selected somebody who would get a lot of attention on the world stage and therefore draw a lot of attention to the need for peace. Some of the recent winners uh, have been uh, interesting people, but they just don't command the presence on the world stage that a President Obama does. I can't remember a time when we had such a media frenzy over the Nobel Peace Prize. Does anyone remember last year's Nobel Peace Prize winner? It was Marty Ahtisari from Finland. He won it for his important efforts on several continents and over more than three decades to resolve international conflicts. All conflicts can be settled, and there are no excuses for allowing them to become eternal. The man actually was working on peace for three decades. No one today remembers how he looks like. And while Obama stock may have gone up with the right-wing media in the U.S. after the speech in Oslo, media in the Middle East remained dubious, and not just Arab media. Many pundits and commentators ridiculed the Nobel Selection Committee. What are his accomplishments vis-a-vis -vis peace, many pundits ask. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this is one of the few times I've seen Arab and Israeli commentators in agreement. They all agreed that his win was a farce. Obama is not a Nobel Peace Prize, and he is still in the process of his own views, and he is still in the process of his own views. Arab and Israeli media in agreement. The Nobel Committee has managed to bridge that divide in a way it never intended. And of course, you can be all high and mighty about peace in Norway. Way wrong! Everyone has a curly mustache. I mean, who's going to invade this place? Nobody except the media. They invade Norway once a year if the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize is a big enough name to be a news story. Good afternoon from here in Oslo. Here's how our Global Village voices see the coverage of the Nobel ceremony in Norway. Most people feel that it was premature for Obama to get that award. He hasn't done anything. If anything, he is escalating war and conflict. In the United States, there's two media, one left and one right. For one, Obama can do no wrong. Everything he does is perfect. I mean, they're not going to criticize anything about him. On the other side, everything he does is wrong. He can do no right. Everything is his fault that happens anywhere. In America, there is no middle ground. And there is little in between when it comes to public and media reaction to Obama's Nobel Peace Prize achievement. Even his supporters say it is somewhat embarrassing to win a major award without having achieved any real goal. Now, if there is one universal point of agreement in the U.S. between the media and both the left and the right, it is that we always support our troops in the execution of their orders. So that when President Obama, in effect, accepted his Nobel on behalf of the United States military, there was little the media could do except to get in line and applaud his remarks. We are now approaching 4,000 viewers following us on Facebook and Twitter. They check in to find out what stories we're working on in case they'd like to weigh in as one of our Global Village voices. If you'd like to do the same, just go to either of those sites and search us out. Or you can get in touch with us the old-fashioned way via email. We're at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Last week, we reported on the blogging and media story in Iran. Now the blogosphere and the mainstream media are abuzz over footage that was aired on a state-run television channel there. The channel, IRIB, broadcast footage of what it called anti-government protesters burning photographs of the late revolutionary leader Ayatollah Khomeini. 
quite apart from accusations that the footage may have been staged to discredit the protesters. You'll notice that no faces are visible. Opposition leaders and senior clerics have charged the channel with desecrating Khomeini's memory by broadcasting the images. The incident allegedly took place during the most recent round of street protests in Tehran and other cities. Viewers in China of a popular network that broadcasts out of Hong Kong have seen their TV screens go blank and they have a pretty good idea of who to blame. Sun TV is based in Hong Kong, but its signal is usually available right across Southeast Asia. An official of the channel reportedly told Agence France Presse that he started getting calls from mainland China on December 5th telling him that viewers had lost Sun TV's signal. He says he told them the signal was still going out and that therefore someone must be blocking it. China keeps a tight lid on many forms of media and Sun TV is known for pushing the limits of political expression. A guilty verdict in the shooting death of a journalist in the Russian Republic of Ingushetia does not, according to his family, amount to justice. Last year, a Russian police officer shot and killed Magomed Yevloyev, who had a website critical of Ingush authorities. His killer has been convicted not of murder, but of negligent homicide and was sentenced to just two years in a minimum security jail. The victim's family said the shooting was not, as the court ruled, an accident, but a deliberate, planned, and organized murder. The Committee to Protect Journalists, which is based in New York, said President Dmitry Medvedev's promise to solve journalists' murders in Russia rings hollow. After this verdict, the victim's family says it plans to appeal the court's decision. A media war is showing signs of breaking out in New York between two of the most influential newspapers in America, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. The Journal would probably say that the Times started it when a columnist there did a piece pegged to the second anniversary of Rupert Murdoch's News Corp buying the Journal. David Carr wrote that the Journal was tilting rightwards under Murdoch, who was using the paper to play politics. Carr also said the Journal's political analyses now tend to come with anti-Barack Obama headlines and that any criticism of former President George W. Bush has pretty much disappeared. The Journal's editor-in-chief, Robert Thompson, accused the Times of sour grapes, basically, saying the Times is uncomfortable with the Journal's success while its own circulation and credibility are in retreat. In case it has somehow failed to come to your attention, Tiger Woods is experiencing marriage difficulties. The American golfer's lawyers have managed to get an injunction, though, in a London court that prevents the media in England from reporting certain new details of Woods' extramarital affairs. Now, we've reported before about English libel laws, how they favor rich and famous people who then use English courts to stop stories being published about them. But British media lawyer Mark Stevens has said that this injunction would never have been granted in America. It's unbelievable that Tiger Woods' lawyers have been able to injunct the UK press from reporting information that is freely available in the US. Woods is doing everything he can to limit bad PR these days in order to preserve his lucrative endorsement deals. Woods' lawyers are razor sharp, and they know that England's libel laws are the best a man can get. We're back after the break with a piece on the black hole that is the media space in Eritrea. Welcome back. For most of the past decade, the African country of Eritrea has been one of the great untold stories. Not that journalists aren't trying, it's just that the government there does not tolerate a free press and hasn't since 2001. For the last three years, when the Media Freedom Group, Reporters Without Borders, compiled its annual press freedom ranking looking at every country in the world, it had Eritrea dead last at 175th. That's behind Iran, Myanmar, even North Korea. It is not easy for reporters to get into Eritrea, but the Listening Post's Sinead O'Shea recently went in undercover. This is her report. This is Eritrea, sometimes called the North Korea of Africa. Eritrea is the only African country to have no privately owned news media. In 2005, the US-based Committee to Protect Journalists described it as one of the world's leading jailers of journalists. For much of the last decade, it has been impossible for foreign journalists to travel there independently to investigate what it's like on the ground. The few reporters allowed into the country have been subject to strict controls. It's a situation that the Paris-based media watchdog Reporters Without Borders monitors closely. And what they reveal is a country that is the most dangerous place in the world for journalists, where all independent media, every newspaper, radio and TV station have been shut down and over 30 journalists have been arrested in Eritrea since 2001. Four of them have lost their lives. 
Medane Haile is part of the four that we know who died in prison. And for the third year now, in 2009, Eritrea was, was ranked um, in the last position of our index, basically because it is a country where there is absolutely no press freedom. Being a journalist is, is very difficult there because um, if you want to express your, your own opinion, uh, you are immediately arrested. Reporters Without Borders have been paying close attention to Eritrea because of a new crackdown by the government on a radio station there. We knew there was a new crackdown in February on Radio Bana and we knew that dozens of journalists had been arrested. So we decided to, to investigate for months uh, on the situation of prisoners and in September we were able to say uh, that there are now 32, at least 32 journalists being jailed. It's no press freedom. Uh, the only media that are tolerated and that are um, there in Eritrea are controlled by the state. We wanted to find out more and decided to travel undercover to Eritrea, posing as tourists. At first glance, Eritrea seems a peaceful and inviting place, but we soon found out that first impressions can be misleading. Moving around the country is difficult, as there are just three roads open to us, and the permits and security checks needed were time-consuming and complicated. People were afraid to talk freely to us, which made it impossible to work normally as a journalist. We were stopped when we pointed the camera in the wrong direction. We've just come back to our hotel fairly rapidly. We were filming on the street and a man with very good English pulled up and told us to stop filming um, and he said he would catch up with us later. So we're back here and we're digitising the footage that we've just filmed. It was these images they didn't want us to record. Food queues are common and prices hugely inflated inside the deserted supermarkets. So I wanted to hear from people about why it was like this. But when we asked, the employee became nervous and uncomfortable. For her own safety, we've decided not to show her on camera. Why are they so expensive? Expensive? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Watching the state-controlled television in Eritrea told its own story too. Television news consists of carefully selected news items intercut with segments from other channels. Coincidentally, these appear to support government interests. The US has been very belligerent towards Eritrea. I think it needs to change politically and engage with Eritrea. While much of the remaining output is focused on military matters. The internet is available, but is extremely slow and many sites are impossible to access. The print media, which are all pro-government, take a patriotic line. Many of the articles in the English language newspaper here focus on the global media's bad behaviour, their mission as they see it to portray Eritrea in a poor light. The Eritrean newspapers make valid points about how the media can be used to advance political agendas. With this in mind, and despite our best efforts, we were unable to find anybody who could speak on camera with us in Eritrea. This man was one of the few who offered any kind of explanation for the country's current situation. His voice has been disguised. Uh, I would say misery has made us to think exactly, because we have passed it. Even the, the past 30 years of struggle has taught us a lot. This is a big history. We learn from that. Eritrea won independence from its much larger neighbour, Ethiopia, in 1993, against near-impossible odds. And the scars from that war are still visible all over the countryside and again, every night, on Eritrean TV screens. In 2001, the government, led by Isia Safawerki, began the first of numerous crackdowns on the media and journalists began to be arrested or disappeared. And in Eritrea, the only information you can get on the ground is coming from the Ministry of Information or from the government, which wants to relay propaganda and, and, and uh, war ideas against the international community in general. Carefully, we prepare to smuggle our account of what we've seen out of the country. Closed to the outside world, Eritrea feels like a place still at war. 
with a government unable to break old habits of control and censorship and a media that has been scared into silence. More Global Village voices now on the state of reporting in Eritrea. The media coverage on Eritrea over the last number of years has been very biased, unfair, and it is as if it's designed to demonize the country and does not reflect the reality of the country at all. The great achievements Eritrea has registered in terms of its food security, in terms of health, in terms of the huge investment that is made in all sectors of the infrastructure um, does not actually get aired on the media. How well is Africa covered by the media? Well, with the exception of one or two remarkable journalists, I'd say very poorly. In today's celebrity-obsessed society, the only thing that would get Eritrea any exposure in the British media at the moment would be if Madonna were to pop over there to acquire another child, or David Beckham were to jet in for a photo opportunity. Then there will be media relevance. Finally, Jason Mraz is an American songwriter who had a huge hit this year with a song called I'm Yours. The first time you hear it, you think, catchy little ditty, but it's received so much airplay that the 50th time you hear it, it's pretty annoying. Now it's been reworked by a five-year-old Japanese boy on a ukulele, and all of a sudden, it's not so annoying anymore. Maybe because the boy doesn't know and therefore cannot sing the lyrics. The original version of the song was big in Japan, but thanks to YouTube, the kid on the ukulele is big everywhere. And with more than four million hits, we've made him our web video of the week. See you next time at The Listening Post.